Yeah, you, you see enough people come in like and they show you these magazine covers yeah. of like the Reggie Bushes or Marshawn Lynch's and the, oh, I want to look like yeah, this. Here's and, his routine. Can yeah, he eats like this. He trains like this. I want to do this. And you're just like, as a trainer, like, oh my God, no, no, yeah. you don't want to do that. It doesn't apply to you. Not, and, and not to mention too, fucking half the time, the shit that's in the magazine isn't even really what they're doing. No. It's just like they're using their likeness and their image to mm. sell you on whatever workout diet plan that's trying to be promoted. So I think that's where the, where I get so passionate about this conversation. And I think sometimes it gets uh, misinterpreted as, you know, I tell anybody who's playing sports, it's bad for you. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not like that. Sports can be amazing. I love sports. I think sports can be amazing for you. But I think it's a terrible strategy for the average person to pick up a sport with the intent of losing body fat or and or yeah. building muscle, you which pick, happens a lot. Yes, if you're picking up a sport, your intent should be to get good at that sport. Yeah, that's the that's the best way. Enjoy to Enjoy the sport it. in its pure form. Boom! Here we are, mind pump time. All right, you're here for the giveaway, aren't you? Here's the giveaway for today: Maps Performance. This is a workout program for those of you that like function, those of you that like to look good but move well, like an athlete would. Okay, that's what Maps Performance is. And I'm going to give it away for free to one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Maps Performance. By the way, we have another channel called Mind Pump Clips. If you want just short clips you can share about us talking about specific topics, go check that page out and subscribe to it as well. It's already blowing up right now. It's really cool. Also, we're running a sale all month long. The starter bundle is 50% off. That includes MAPS Anabolic, uh, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So that's half off. And then we also have MAPS Split. This is a bodybuilder style, body part split routine, high volume, okay? That program is 50% off. So you can get either one half off or both half off, but you got to go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code MAYSPECIAL for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Sports, they're not good for you. It's not a healthy way to get fit and healthy. Ooh. Yeah, so Is I know. this because you play sports ball? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, no. In hot like no, I like, I like this conversation. Um, we've talked on the podcast several times, especially when we've answered questions related to sports and we remind people of this. Yeah. And I actually just happen to be going back through some of our comments on YouTube. And I, I don't get a chance to read them all, but sometimes I'll go through there and just kind of read what people are saying. And I saw this on multiple occasions where people were like, those guys don't know what they're talking about. Like, Yeah, we should explain. Yeah, so I, I think the context matters here, right? Yeah. Yes, like, okay, being active is better than not being active. Of course, it has to be appropriate because you can, you can work out or play sports in a way that's inappropriate for your fitness and your body, in which case it's not healthy. It could you know, obviously hurt you and cause problems. But yeah, being appropriately active is always better than not being active. Now, here's where... We're going when we say sports are not healthy. I think, first off, the roots of it are when we look at high-level athletes as the epitome of health and fitness. So we look at a professional basketball player, or a professional football player, or a baseball player, and we say that is the epitome of fitness and health. I'm going to follow their routine. I'm going to do what they do because that's what that is. And it's it's not. What they are, what they really are, is the epitome of performance for their given sport not health and longevity. At some point, when you push performance past a certain point, you actually start to trade longevity and health for performance. Uh, it's it's most clear in professional football. Professional football is one of the most like, just brutal, it's taxing, taxing damaging sports. <clears throat> look, at the law, look at the lifespan of the average professional football player. I think it's like, is it the 50s or 60? Something like that. Um, it, this is true for, look at a, a retired, uh, professional basketball player. Look at, look at them when they're in their fifties and sixties, watch them walk, watch them move. And you'll see lots of problems. So at some point performance, you push performance, you lose longevity and health. This is true for strength sports too, powerlifting, mm -hmm. bodybuilding, CrossFit, whatever you trade the two. So it's important to communicate this because we often look at athletes as the examples of health and longevity. They are not the examples of health and longevity. Those are the examples of performance, mm -hmm. which is something that can be well. Totally and there's different. another there's another piece of that that, that you're missing because you use the analogy, and I'm glad you <clears> did because I wanted to bring up other ones because I, people were one of the things I saw the threads going back and forth were, you know, of course football, but not all sports. And I said, name one. 
you know, name me a sport that isn't, and I'll make the case for how it can be. Right. Because uh, it's not – football seems so obvious because you have two guys That's why running that full yeah. speed edge to try to kill each other. car crashes. That's kind of obvious. Like, people go like, okay, well, what? yeah, what, what about volleyball or basketball or baseball or tennis or mm -hmm. golfing or some of these other – what is un the, what the most unhealthy part about professional sports is the decades of repetitive movements, yeah. the same way, the same side, yeah. over and over and over. So that explosive is explosive repetitive stress. Yes. So that that's the, like a, a, a golfer doesn't a right handed golfer doesn't practice his left handed. He doesn't swing. develop balance. Yeah. A right handed pitcher doesn't practice his left handed pitch. Yeah. A, a batter doesn't. Practice the opposite side, so you become very, very dominant yeah. on one side based off of your sport. And there's not a lot of sports that have you equally balanced out, which and torques your spine. It causes all kinds of uh, problems down the road. You know, from chronic, it's this chronic uh, use of, of those same repetitive patterns. And so, you know, in terms of us saying it's not healthy, this is we're talking about the long term play here, not. And also, I wanted to address like the 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 person that will play a sport to get in shape. Yes. Uh, Thank and this you. is this is a common thought, especially basketball tends to be one of those kind of sports that people just pick it up and they think that if I play it more often, I'm just going to be in really good shape and do good for my body. Okay, you know what the problem with that is? is that, here's what I'll tell you. Now, is that when you go into a sport to get into shape, you treat it like a workout. What does that mean? I'm going to go play basketball. I need to lose weight, so I'm going to go play basketball. So what do you do? You play basketball hard. You don't focus on skill, technique, balance. You know, this is like running. This is why running causes so many injuries. It's not that humans aren't good at running. <clears throat> humans evolved to be amazing runners. Long distance runners were among the best in the animal kingdom. But the problem is people say, I'm going to run to lose weight. So they don't go and practice the skill of running. They lace up their shoes and they go run until they're tired. Mm -hmm. So the technique is off, biomechanics are off, they mess themselves <clears throat> up. So when people pick up a sport to lose weight, that's what happens versus a kid signing up to play basketball. What does a coach do? A good coach teaches them skills. They teaches them proper biomechanics. They teach them how to do the, the, the techniques and the moves to become better at that sport, not just run them until they're totally exhausted. Bad coaches do that, but good ones don't. So that's the important thing to consider here is sports are, yes, they're active. And if you're appropriately active, it's better than not being active. So I want to be clear here that that's definitely true, but going to do a sport to lose weight, there's far better ways well, that, to do it. That's where this stems from. But the, the, at least that for me, the, yeah. the passion behind telling people that and getting fired up and like debating with people on how unhealthy sports can be is because I've seen so many people pick up a sport with the intent to lose 30 pounds or to get into good shape. Yeah. And it's a terrible strategy for that. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about longevity, overall health, staying fit for the rest of your life, playing a sport where you're going to do repetitive movements or because eventually that will wear down the body and then maintaining whatever that sport might have got you to is going to be extremely difficult. You that being said, I would never, ever, ever tell one of my clients who loves to play a sport not to. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, I did want to address that too, because there's a way that you can keep incorporating it in a healthy manner, which means you got to spend more time building the body up, reinforcing the joints, doing the excess mundane work mobility wise and things that will help to keep you at top condition and bulletproof as you're going through these intensely uh, uh, rigorous type of movements that put a lot of stress and demand uh, around the joints. So if you do put the work in, you can actually uh, benefit your, your sport that you love to play. You just actually, as you go along, you have to kind of uh, uh, reframe it as this is you're competing, you're performing. That's a different uh, mentality towards the training side of things. Yes. We, we, we've evolved so much in the science of this, what you're talking about, Justin. This is why professional athletes now spend millions of dollars a year on recovery. It's the yeah. reason why you see people like LeBron James that are going to play 20 plus years in a sport. They like didn't that. do that before. No, it, did, it did rarely ever happened. And definitely not somebody that that explosive, that big, but he spends a million dollars a year on taking care of his body. Yep. Now, you may not have to spend as much money and time, but you're also not training as hard and playing as hard. Yeah, you're as, not a professional athlete. Right. But that, that the same the same 
idea applies to you. If you want to play a sport into your 40s and 50s and 60s, then you have to take the time to also take care of the body by protecting the joints and strengthening your yeah. core and rotational movements yeah, and things like that. because there is a quality of life thing, right? I love doing it, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, yeah. I love doing it. I enjoy it. Well, I love playing sports. Quality of life, it contributes to health as well. And if you really enjoy it, like my dad... He loves riding a motorcycle. He likes to ride it fast. It's dangerous, you know, but it improves his quality of life so much. He loves it so much that the risk is worth uh, the reward for him, right? So, by the way, you know that that there have been um, like Roman artifacts or I should say artifacts where they'll find burial sites with ancient soldiers and they'll pick up the bones and examine them and they can tell which ones were, you know, used the bow or which ones threw discus, which ones... Because they did these shape the body. These they did repetitive motions so often that their bones obviously morphed and adapted, and you could tell by the spine. And they'll see like one arm, one humerus is much thicker than the other. And like, well, this guy probably threw discus, you know, for a living or whatever. In England, I know they found a bunch of longbowmen, mm -hmm. and they could see that the spine was twisted. Even I mean, those longbows, you know, that was like a super you know, military advancement at the time. Required, I think it was like two hundred pounds worth of pulling power and their bodies contorted and twisted and adapted to that. And so when you look at sports, what makes a sport that sport is a set type of movements, repetitive movements. You look at rowing, you look at baseball or football or basketball or any other sport, there's like repetitive mo movements within most sports. And that's what kind of develops uh, some of those issues. Strength training is an awesome form of exercise because I can mold it and modify it regardless of what I'm doing in my life. So if, I, if I'm if i a rower and I'm constantly doing this rowing motion, I can help <laughs> counter that with certain strength training exercises to kind of offset some of those uh, potential issues that you might develop from doing that repetitive motion over and over again. Well, I'm so, glad you brought it mm -hmm. up because it's another one of those things that reminds me of when we talk about cardio. People love to take it out of context yeah, no. and then try and pick it apart like... I would never tell a client that loves playing their sport to stop playing their sport. Like that's for yep. what for yep. exact reasons you said, but the people that I think we are trying to address, which by the way, okay, the people we're trying to address are the larger po population or the majority. Yeah. It's, it's rare that I have somebody who is a, you know, ball player and just wants to keep it going their whole life. Like that, that's more rare. What's really common is that we, we idolize these professional athletes. We put them on the cover of shape magazine and muscle magazine, and they have great bodies and we look at it and we want to emulate what they're doing. And Oh, by the way, they happen to play the sport I played when I was in high school. And so here I am 40 years old. I haven't played basketball since I was 16. And you, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in shape because yeah. I want to look like so and so and you know that's that's who we're trying yeah. to speak to yeah. is like and that's there, a terrible and one. that's such a high let's like it's such a high level of and also you're dealing with genetic anomalies i don't remember i should have wrote this down i don't know athletes like you guys do but there was a football player i don't know his name and he was wearing kind of the you know the half jersey or whatever and he's got ripped abs and then he talked about like how he eats he's like i eat like once a day uh oh. two or three bags of candy joe and, DeFranco posted about that yes yeah i don't yeah. know who that's sean lynch about. No, we Marshall should look. It, it no, Reggie we should Bush? look it up. But he was he was talking about yeah. how he just like eats candy and like eats once a day. And he looks the way he does. It's like, yeah, I don't remember his. You're not gonna look like him if you eat like him. I'm just gonna tell you right now. <laughs> that's a whole other. That's a whole other type of human, you know. And yeah, so right. we can't always we can't look at these people at that level and say that's what I'm gonna do to get fit and healthy. It's, even if you had their genetics, they're not doing what makes them fit and healthy. They're doing what makes I, them. I also think the other level. thing that makes me really passionate about that too is that you know I've I've had the opportunity to be around a lot of professional athletes, and they are not uh, the um, shining example of health. <laughs> There's, in fact, I would I would make the case that a very small percentage of them mm -hmm. are really healthy. They are awesome and at their at yeah. their gift, and they have incredible despite their habits, right? But many of them have drug habits abuse other things they're like and again adding to the repetitive thing so but and, and i think that's where this this conversation really came from as a trainer who's trained been doing this for such a you long just, time you gotta hear it all the time yeah you you see enough people come in like and they show you these magazine covers yeah. of like the reggie bushes or marshawn lynch's and the, oh, i want to look like yeah, this here's and, his routine Can yeah he eats like this he trains like this i want to do this and you're just like as a trainer like oh my god no no yeah. you don't want to do this that doesn't apply to you not, and, and not to mention too fucking half the time the shit that's in the magazine isn't even really what they're doing no it's just like they're using their likeness 
and their image to mm. sell you on whatever workout diet plan that's trying to be promoted. So I think that's where the, where I get so passionate about this conversation. And I think sometimes it gets uh, misinterpreted as, you know, I tell anybody who's playing sports, it's bad for you. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not like that. Sports can be, ama I love sports. I think sports can be amazing for you, but I think it's a terrible strategy for the average person to pick up a sport with the intent of losing body fat or and or yeah. building muscle, you which pick, happens a lot. Yes, if you're picking up a sport, your intent should be to get good at that sport. Yeah, that's the that's the best way. Enjoy to Enjoy the sport it. in its pure form. Totally. Right. And speaking of workouts, oh my god, dude, I did I did the perfect formula yesterday for a maximum pump in my workout today. So what did we say before? Right to get a, a, the best pump, carbs, lots of carbs, water. lots of sodium. Lots of water. Yeah. Okay, so here's what happened, right? So yesterday, I had, for all intents and purposes, I was starting my cut. This is my summer cut I'm starting right now. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to eat less calories. This is going to be great. Unfortunately, we met up with some friends, and they, the, the, so Jessica's, one of her friends from Cirque. So when Jessica used to work for Cirque du Soleil, she made some good friends there, and one of her friends came to visit. And she's like, we have to eat at this restaurant. Um, it's called Din... Tai Fung. Have you heard of this before? Doug has, of course. Okay. I know Doug has. <laughs> so uh, it's burgers a, there? Or it's not a joke. No. I know he has. <laughs> no, it's not burgers and pizza. <laughs> oh, man. So <laughs> now <laughs> apparently it's a chain. I had no idea. So I've seen this place um, over at Valley Fair here in the Bay Area and I've walked by and it's always got this long ass line. And I'm always like, what? And you can't really see. It's like a small entrance or whatever. And I'm like, what is in there? That is such a long line. Like, this is so crazy. It never went in though. Anyway, we go there and we put our name down three hour wait three hour wait so i'm like this place better be amazing yeah anyway Sounds apparently like it's a chain Island. she's eating in it, she the first time that they it's had a it. chain and it has that many people it's, waiting i think it's a chain so she had it in taipei the first time and jessica's had it too uh with her friend um, in some of these countries that they've traveled to and it, it's apparently it's amazing whatever so i'm like all right whatever we'll wait till you know we'll wait for three hours so we did we walked around hung out whatever ate some snacks then we go in, and what it is, it's, 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 like, it's like dumplings and pork buns and that kind of food, right? Mm. Which I'm not super familiar with. It was amazing. However, it's, it's like carb heaven. It's like, <laughs> like doughy dough. <laughs> Yeah, there's like big things of dough. Yeah, how did you do that? It's like, there. isn't it like gluten? Bro, crazy? Yeah, well, so I'll tell you in a second. So my gut has been amazing, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it, it, it just, it was so much carbs. It was like fried rice, you know, shrimp dumplings, pork dumplings, chicken dumplings, and you know, then there were like pork buns and just like so many carbs. Then I was so thirsty. I probably drank about two gallons of water <laughs> from doing this. Like sodium, yeah. tons of carbs. Tons of water. Worked out today, this morning. I was five pounds heavier, by the way. Gained five pounds of water. <laughs> the most intense pump ever. It was just incredible. This crazy pump. But uh, good food, by the way. Good food. I'm, I'm, you've been there, right, Doug? Yeah, a couple times. Amazing. What do you think, Doug? I mean, I like it. It's yeah. uh, dim sum. It's basically Chinese like dumplings and things. Okay. Yeah, this uh, chain was actually started in Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's where they first had it. But anyway, you asked about my gut because gluten bothers me a lot. Yeah, time. I figured that place would be full of gluten. Okay, dude. First off, my gut got, you know, I've done, I did a few things a while ago. My gut got a lot better. And then we started working with seed again. So I've been taking seed regularly. Mm -hmm. I have, my gut has never been this great, this consistent for this long. But yeah. I had, normally, if I eat a big ass meal of just a bunch of gluten like that, especially the kind of gluten that that was like not even cooked, it's like doughy stuff. Oh yeah. I'd be, that would destroy me, dude. I'd be ruined. Fine. Totally fine. Totally fine. No problems whatsoever. So we, speaking of sweet seed, we actually just yesterday ordered uh max, a probiotic through them. They have them for so kids. So they have too. kids now. Yeah. They have a kids. Oh, one. So how awesome. do they do it for kids? It's not in a capsule. I Is actually, it a powder? I don't know yet. I just ordered it. So Katrina ordered it. So I haven't seen I'm going to get some. Yeah. I'll really get it probably probably tomorrow. I would assume I would have it. So I'll let There's, you guys, dude, I'll report back. But max has been like sick like crazy and the <sighs> the doctor can yeah dude it, i we so <laughs> and we still have yet to string 14 days in a row since october of last year so we uh we were out of town last week we got back in right we worked friday we did the interview with cameron haynes and then we mm -hmm. took off early after that so i got home earlier than than normal and i got home in time to go with katrina to actually pick max up from school She's like, oh, you should come with me. He'll be so excited. You're never because you're not here to pick him up. So I'm like, okay, cool, I'll come. 
So, and we're all excited because uh, this is like the first weekend that her and I have had in a long time where we didn't have other, you know, engagements going on or we didn't have company. Oh, nice. So we're like, oh yeah, we had Saturday. Jerry was going to come Family over. Family time. Yeah. Jerry's going to come over and watch Max so we could do like a day, you know, day at the beach and maybe do dinner and stuff like that. So we're all excited about this kind of chill weekend we have coming. So we're at the, we're at a school, right? And um, I, I, he sees me and he's like waving to me and I, and the, you see the teacher bringing him through, you know, to check him out and stuff like that. And as he's coming over, he like, he stops right by the door, drops his head bleh, and oh. just throws up. And I'm like, no, no, dude, please tell me he ate something weird right now and he's just feeling this way. But he threw up in the car on the way home. So fully then, sick. Oh, yeah. Fever. So we hit 104 temperature oh, that night. Oh, buddy. Back. Oh, Come on. That sucks. But anyways, the doctor actually um, recommended a uh, a probiotic for him. So because we've had Aurelius on a probiotic since he was uh, real young. And I can tell the difference when he goes on and, go, and goes off of it. Yeah. I can. Yeah, I can. Because he'll get a little bit of a skin reaction depending on what he eats. And when he's on the probiotic regularly. That that tends to get a little better. His digestion gets better too. So I think it's uh, I think it's valuable. But I I didn't know Seed had one for kids. I didn't either. Katrina sent me a message saying, "Hey, the doctor uh, sent me over this this uh, probiotic formula." But I was actually looking at Seed. Obviously, Katrina helps oversee and manage the partner, so she's aware of all her partner. She goes, and they have a, a kids one. Which one do you want me to get? I'm like, oh my god, Seed for sure. So I mean, I've dude, I've tried probably 30 different types of probiotics yeah, and I'll get some the best. I'll get some value from each one of them sometimes I get zero value but usually I'll get a little value I swear to, I swear to god dude I take seed and it's like it's like I'm invincible and I hate saying that because yeah. I, I don't want people to get the wrong idea but for me you guys know you I mean we went out we were trying I was eating whatever and yeah. normally you guys know I have to be very careful otherwise it I just wish I was more consistent you know like that that's my biggest thing I'll I'll go on a string and I feel great and like my guts all nice and everything and then it's just I don't know. Like I just got to keep taking it and every so take it right before you got to get one of these, dude. Yeah, there you go. I I feel like such an old man having to buy one of these. A supplement case. I've never. You got to just concede and be like, look, I I do have like daily things I need to take. Well, I'm not like this guy. He's like he's all he's been in. Carries his purse around. Yeah, exactly. I I remember what to take when. I just don't. I have. I've never been good. I mean, maybe creatine. I've been the most consistent with, uh, and that's just because I'm good about. I actually keep, so here we have obviously multiple jars of creatine that's out in the workout floor. And then I have one literally in my garage, in my gym. So that's the only reason why I'm consistent with that. Cause I'll take it like midway or towards the end of my workout. Yeah. So I don't forget. Yeah. Dude, if I want you guys to take something, what do I always do? I have to give it to you guys regularly. Yes. I'll come and pres- feed it. <laughs> you know, you know why that would never work for me? That case. Why? It doesn't fit all the supplements. I would take yeah, no, I know it wouldn't fit all the ones you <laughs> take. I, I think Doug's the same way. Yeah. Like we can't, Doug takes probably almost as much as I do. I don't Are you good? Are you consistent? with your pills yeah i am what i do is i buy these little baggies on amazon mm-hmm. and then i Drug have dealer baggies yeah and i have these little, <laughs> i have these little cups little i line bags. up you know for every day of the week and then i just take my bottles shot, and drop shot, them in there and shot, dump shot, them in the bag yeah, i bought four of these and like and dumped all the pills that i need to take like the whole layout for i like how it's color coded too for you yeah it's, it's got the it actually night and day right. on it and yeah. it's got that's why i picked it it's got wow. yeah it's very Organized. So, so, no, so seed, take it. You know what you do, Justin? Because it's better to take it on an empty stomach. Mm-hmm. Put it next Very to your first bed. Thing. No, 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 no. Put it next to your bed. So right when you go to bed, take two. Oh, when you sleep. go to bed. So yeah. I've, yeah, I've, that's what I, I do, do in the morning. Being completely transparent when it comes to any probiotics, like I've never, like, like you, like talk about, I can hell I feel it. You guys crazy. It's like you make a big deal about it all the time. The that biggest, like, yeah. he does do it like that. Does he do it like that? Oh, it's yeah. just like it's amazing. Is he not, he did two in, days, you guys. Did he not come in talking about seed just like that? Oh my God, yeah. can you guys feel it? I yeah. can feel it. Right? Look at he this picture. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> where, okay, where, where the biggest thing that I've been able to uh, connect it to is, um, you know, we one of Katrina's favorite foods is either hamburgers or pizza. Both of them destroy me, uh, at least now. Like they used to not when I was a kid, but they definitely destroy me now. If I uh, proactively have a the probiotic before, it totally mitigates how how I feel afterwards. Like it doesn't make me feel great or amazing, 
but it will you notice the difference. Oh yeah, yeah. I know it's a big difference. Where if I don't take it, it's guaranteed yeah. I'm you know in the bathroom ten minutes later, and I'm just like I feel lethargic and bloated the next day. Those symptoms don't seem to be there when I take the. Well, I'm excited to try the one for the baby. I had no idea. Yeah, no. Awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. It'll be here in yeah. a day or two. I think I don't know if it's pill or, or liquid or what it is. It, it must it must be liquid be, or, or or a powder, powder because it, you can't. What are you gonna give a capsule to your son? Yeah, yeah. You no, can't do that's that. a good point. I didn't even yeah. think about that. Hey, so are you guys ready for spider season? Isn't this spider season, Justin? Dude, it no, must October be because. So we had some of the windows open and what? Cause it was, dude, it was blazing hot over the weekend. So I'm saying, I yeah. think they're coming inside. No, yeah, they have been. I actually last night I saw a big one, like because I was letting the dogs out, like crawling its way towards the stairs and had to like smash it. They're everywhere right now. They're stringing from the trees, like oh, yeah. So I we hate- have that. We have gophers and we have like uh, uh, like uh, paper wasps. So those are my new enemies. What's a paper wasp? Paper wasps. It, they just make little nests like in the roof. Like in the gutters and whatnot, and uh, do they sting still? Yeah, yeah, they're they're oh, shitty wasps. I hate I mean, those bastards. What yeah. about the gophers? How are you getting rid of so gophers? So gophers. Okay, I've been wanting to talk about this because this has been like literally Caddyshack. Okay, you remember like Bill Murray <laughs> and like do. he's trying to throw all this like explosives and holes and you know smoke them out and like like rush them out with water. Like I literally did like all these things. Because I had no idea how destructive these little fuckers are. Yeah, they're really destructive. Yeah. Like and. Courtney, it's uh, poor Courtney has been like really trying to to overcome her brown thumb, uh, so to speak, in terms of like killing um, plants. And she's trying to like create this whole garden. And like so we have like a bunch of uh, vegetables and and uh, different fruit and herbs and things she's been growing. And so she's like really taking pride in this thing. Right. And then these little bastards like are getting up there and like eating all the roots. And then you see them like just slowly dying. And so she's like trying to get me involved. And uh, I've been taking my BB gun out there. And like when they poke their little head up and like eat, like I actually like took one out uh, once and I was really happy about that. (laughs) So (laughs) this was actually one of my favorite parts of uh, being on a ranch when we were kids, because we had, uh, so the, we, they would do, they'd burrow and make all these holes and we had horses and horses would roll their ankle. Oh, and then that's it. Yeah. And that like really could fuck a horse up. So you you had to kill them. Like, so So we would would lay out there too. It sucks, you know? Cause like one of them got caught in like one of the snares and, and it was like, you know, you had to put it out of its misery, and Courtney couldn't do it. She went off crying, and like she was like, "Can you handle this?" And I'm just like, "Oh!" And this little guy's just like, ah. and I had to take a big rock and smash it. Oh. Oh, it was awful, dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> Phone call from Peter coming. Oh man, I've been, dude. It's hey, but we fine. We I got ate, like we, we twenty ate, of them. We ate the meat though. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, we ate, ate it. It was delicious. We ate the meat. No, I mean, we were smoking it. these things out. We took like literally, you take flares and you. No, you down, don't. Yeah, you put them down the hole and you cover it, and it supposedly like smokes them out. And so I was like waiting to see where they'd pop their little head out and take them out. Wow. Well, now, are, is there water, anything you can do to prevent and, them? Can you put like a fence or something in the ground around your? Like, well, what do you do? So I guess, well, if you have a vegetable garden, they have like this like little cage you can put underneath um, the, oh. the roots of it, so that way they they can't. They get can't to it. it get to it, but um, yeah, it was, they've already been in there before we got those. So now it's just a matter of like trying to, Dude, to catch them. My like, my the grand, my grandfather. So old school Italians, their backyard. Even if they have like a five by five backyard, it's like it's always going to be a full on garden. For vegetables. Maxed out, right? So <laughs> my dad's yard is like this. My grandfather's yard is like this. My grandfather, my dad, my uncles. It is a constant war against the squirrels. And you hear them talk about these squirrels <laughs> yeah, and the they squirrels. get together and talk about the squirrels. Yeah. And you think you're ta- you're hearing like a couple veterans talk war, about war stories. <laughs> yeah, like the Nazis or something like that. I get it, dude. Oh, I dude. Had, I had a squirrel infestation. Oh, in my dad has done everything. He's put like like shiny smooth like things around the tree so they can't climb up, but then they figure out how to jump from another tree to another. Then he puts something over it. Then he stays out in the backyard to try and catch them. My grandfather uses cages and he tries to drown them and my cousins are all crying. One time, my grandfather, <laughs> one time, my grandfather caught a squirrel because he had because because they grow fruit trees and if and they'll eat all your fruit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my grandfather had a bunch of persimmons, which we all know this in the family. Don't mess with my grandfather's persimmons because he'll kill you. Whether you're a kid or you're a squirrel, it doesn't matter. Don't mess with his persimmons. Well, anyway, there's these squirrels are kipping persimmons. 
So my cousin was over there and my cousin at this time was like 20. So he's like an adult, right? My grandfather catches a squirrel. Now my cousin, he's a bit of an animal lover. So my cousin sees the squirrel in the cage. And if you ever catch a squirrel, they scream. Yeah. So he's like, we got to let this thing go. My grandfather's like, no. And he grabs a squirrel and he goes, yeah, I'm going to show you. You're going to be a man today. These squirrels try to eat our fruit. You're going to, I'm going to make you a man. And he, Tried to drown it in front of my cousin to kill it. <laughs> and my cousin kicked the, because it was a bucket full of water, kicked it open. And then he let the squirrel out. And there was this huge, like my cousin, my grandfather, this huge fight <laughs> over this whole thing. And my cousin's like, I'm never going to come over here again if you kill squirrels. And my grandfather's like, you would die in Sicily in one day. Yeah. If you're like, <laughs> I was like, wow, dude. Just, yeah, they're just cute rat, like tree rats. Oh, dude. Yeah. Speaking, of, hey, speaking of like little vermin or whatever, uh, I was in the shower the other day. And I'm taking a shower and I hear Jessica and, and she's got the baby and I hear her go, Sal, get out of the shower right now. So I'm like, huh? huh? Like, what the hell's going on? Like, first I'm like, did I get in trouble? What did I do? I'm thinking like, eh. she's like, come in here right now. I have the baby. I'm not trying to freak out. So I'm like, oh, it must be a spider. Now Jessica's, she's got arachnophobia for sure. So I'm like, it's probably like a little tiny spider. Not a big deal. Bro. This big, <laughs> this big, dude. That's in the was, house, a redwood spider. In that the we closet, get. massive spider like this. Oh my God. I'm like, and the only reason why she didn't scream and freak out is because she has the baby and she's trying to not freak him out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, let me get my shoes. She's like, no, if you miss it, I swear to God, we'll move out of this house. I swear we'll never. <laughs> she's like, I have to watch it and I have to watch you kill it. Otherwise, I'm never coming back in. I'm like, oh my God, dude. So she's like, go get the can of Raid. I'm like, Raid ain't going to do shit. No, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Big. So the strategy was I sprayed it with the Raid, which made it run it off <laughs> but slowed it down slowed it down so it's like running but you can tell the chemicals are like hitting it like, uh, uh, uh. so it's just getting high yeah it's, yeah. it's like Burr. and then i smashed it yeah. saved the day or whatever but i'm like damn dude Man, these, lucky yeah these uh these vermin i think katrina was telling me she just called courtney the other day and she's like oh she's like yeah courtney put me on hold she was like killing gophers <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> she's obsessed dude i'll tell you the last month she's just like all like she's dreaming about it like she keeps talking like Every conversation on my way home is like, you know, how many she's got in the yeah. traps. Like, she's like obsessed with Isn't it. Isn't that dude. funny how like some, just depends on what animals do for you. If they steal your food, kill them. If they're ugly, kill them. If they're cute and they're friendly, love them or whatever. Yeah. We had a wild bunny in the backyard and I'm just like so excited. Like, let's, uh, that's our pet. Dude, yeah. let's, let's put some food out there or whatever, you know. <laughs> that thing let's will cut you dude. up real quick. I've, I've turned oh, her into yeah. a wild, wild bunny. Yeah. Hell yeah. Really? With these hell yeah. Bro, you corner a rabbit, they'll get all crazy. Really? On you. Yeah, Oh, dude. man. You should do it. Try and catch it. See yeah, how it works well. out. Let it's me not going to bite you at all. <laughs> My dad yeah. caught a Doesn't rabbit. Have My dog caught a, caught a rabbit one. I want to tell you what he did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, you know that in Italy, they cook rabbits. Yeah. And they eat them. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, we had a rabbit in the backyard once when I was a kid. And my sister was like, it's my pet. And then- we ate it, and then oh wow! And then you with the pet my story, sister we're for know. sure getting shut down by Peter. My yeah. sister didn't know; <laughs> she didn't know, and I told her. My dad, you know, I, I was an older brother. I'm like, oh, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna tell my sister. She cried and dude, cried. please, please tell me of you course. guys watch. Did you guys watch the Our Father, the sperm doctor one? Oh, yes, God. dude. Let's talk. So about I watched half messed of it. up stuff. I watched half of it, and I got up to the point where it was. Like <laughs> the sibling count kept going up. I'm like, oh my god, bro, it's still yeah, going. It's still going. It's still going. They're like at ninety something right now. <laughs> this guy was just so yeah. So the crazy he was just going part back is, and bust the load, and then they must not have accounted for the fact that like twenty three and me like type technology was going to come out. No, because when he first did it, it wasn't out. No. Yeah. And so this this was like a whole new thing, and there's no legislation either, which is the craziest part to prevent uh, a. A doctor, what do you call that kind of doctor? Like fertility doctor. A fertility doctor yeah. to to do this kind of thing. So basically, um, well, to to kind of sum it up, I mean, he was basically going off, jacking off, taking his own sample and inseminating women with the, his own. The worst part. So the, there were the women who were thought they were getting a donor sperm, <clears throat> and the idea was we'll find a donor that matches you and your husband because your husband's infertile. And what he would do is he would go in the back, use his own sample, impregnate and impregnate the women. That sucks because- Not so not bad told. though. The worst was when the husbands needed fertility treatment and they would do insemination from the husband and he would switch out the yeah. husbands with his. They brought his. their own sample and he would switch it out for the doctors. Oh. Like, that, can you imagine? What a piece of 
That's I was telling shit. Justin in the in the show they they only really interview the kids all the kid and the kids are talking about how devastated they are because they thought this was their parent their entire life but imagine being a dad yeah uh, I mean I all, I can think, I'm watching it and Max you're is playing torn, it you're the, torn because you've you've brought yeah. this kid up not like you love him any less right you but still, what you've thought is now different yeah I, and I don't know about you guys but like I don't know there's a thing the, part of the e excitement or what I would about having my son and why I wanted a boy first was knowing that I'm passing my bloodline down right sure so that's like literally what I'm thinking when I think about having my son and so imagine I go 30 years from now and take a he takes a 23 me and then I find out it was some other somebody else that's not even your well, genetically you can like see some of your traits yeah you know and and you know, to to remove that from these parents is criminal. Like, I would it's crazy. I would be torn because a uh, torn up because you raise a kid and you find out it's not yours genetically. You love them. You still love them the same. You yeah, raise yeah, them, yeah, of course. But now you feel terrible because now they're gonna know. You're gonna know. What does this mean? But does this change anything? And it's just what you thought was something was something else. I mean, it doesn't change. Like I would love my kids if I found out one of my kids wasn't mine. It wouldn't change how much I love them at all. But boy, it would still be devastating. That you doctor is got to be the clearest example of the most, like the ultimate narcissist psychopath. Well, the part that was great, one lady said, she goes, because um, he would do that. He would, he'd leave. And what they would do is they were supposed to go to the hospital across the street, get a fresh sample, bring it back, and then inseminate. Because back then the technology wasn't as good with keeping sperm alive or whatever. So they were literally, the donors would be, you know, creating the sample in almost real time. He, this woman's and he did this woman went through 15 procedures with her till she got pregnant she goes i got raped 15 times and i didn't even know it and i'm like yeah yeah that's well, kind of what happened yeah the, well the crazy part is that there's like justin said there's no loss against it so he got nothing yeah. got a fi so, 500 dollars fine yeah 500 dollars fine what yeah. yeah he got a slap on the wrist yeah they didn't even wow. factor that in like, nothing in, in, to legislate so. and there wow. still isn't there still isn't any laws to really and stop he's it. not the only doctor that's done this yeah they found since then over 40 other doctors. Oh, what? Yeah. I did not know Some that. Some people like are like, I think there's one group that's up to like a hundred something of uh, siblings that they've identified so far through like one of these 23 and me. It's like, and the thing is they're watching it every day to basically see. Cause like, how crazy is that? You go to see like uh, who you're related to, you do this test, and all of a sudden, like you're only supposed to get a few results, right? <laughs> and you treat all of a sudden, it's like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my god, like th that's just like that's so much to take in. Oh, that's that's crazy. I, you know, well, at least they got doctor genes. I, though, I feel huh? like the show. I, I feel like the show <laughs> never really did it well, <clears throat> and I don't know if it was intended to be left open like this, or it's because they really like it. I never, I never felt like I really understood while he was doing it. Like you, the, you have moments where you're like, is he getting off on this? Is this something that he's getting off on because he's going and he's jerking off and he's going over and then he's inseminating? Well, them? that's the part because he had to get, he had to get aroused <laughs> right. and, and ejaculate all within a very short period of time. Enough time that they would calculate he's going to the hospital across the street to get the sample to bring it back. Right. So is it that, or is it that he's just such a narcissist well, that he, he wants to see his his genes? There's got to be part of that because he actually did visit a lot of the families initially after the, the birth. Right to 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 you know, with his wife, they would go visit um, some like some of these parents that well, just he ended up gave being birth a, and he, would be like, you know, uh, want to connect with them. He well, he ended up being the gynecologist for one of his oh daughters. Oh, That's right. what the? F That's right. yeah. That was a little plot one. twist. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. You know, what the, yeah. you know. By the way, there's rules. The reason why they have rules where they don't they don't allow one donor to donate. More than a, so many yeah, samples. They, yeah, it's only supposed to be three, and it's so you don't and end up marrying your brother or sister. Yeah, yeah. You imagine? Well, yeah, you do that enough. To, if you have a guy in Man, uh, you one and your town, really look alike. And yeah. he, yeah, yeah, you have a guy in one one town, and he's inseminated. You know, 90, oh, 90 yeah. There's a very good chance that that they showed this like five mile proximity in like all of these people that were related to each other. That's yeah, from so, him. That's so gross. But yeah. I don't think I don't think actually they had anybody that ended up marrying or anything like that. So I think no. they lucked out on that part. But I did see a story about like this and, and i think this was on like uh, one of those other podcasts like barstool or something um but there was like a so this kid basically was reconnecting to find his mom who who had uh, sent him off for adoption and over the years had been trying to trace her and, and so anyway they finally connect over the pandemic or whatever and 
they like fell in love with each other. What? And started like, you know, doing it. What the? F- <laughs> with each other. <laughs> And like, and like she's professing like she wants to have his baby and everything. Everybody's just like, no. Where was this? Oh, this, oh, this on a podcast? Were yeah, this, story? this is real news though. It's not like oh, made up. It's not oh, like a national no. choir or anything. It's just like <laughs> that's real against, life we're living in right that's now. That's against every yeah. law of nature. Uh, you so know that there's there's there's, there's literal like genetic um, like like stops that'll prevent you from being attractive to siblings and relatives. Like there's there's actual. They've identified this because obviously you know that you need. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Like, well, well isn't there isn't bad there some, genes you're passing on? Isn't there a theory around kissing and the exchanging of our bacteria with someone? Is saliva of, and stuff you pick up? Uh, yeah, like so, cues. Well, yeah. There's so so, I, and I don't know how much truth there is to this. I I can't remember where I first saw this, but they they I've heard where you you know people talk about like that chemistry of the first kiss. Of like, oh, I just knew from yeah. the first kiss or what that that there it's the exchanging of bacteria that we we are naturally do and the compatibility of it is what makes us. I've feel. read that. Yeah, is it, I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, right? I read there's some studies that sh- that theorize that, and there's some decent there's some you know evidence to suggest. That you looking that, that up for me, Doug, or what? That might. It was be on Drinking case. Bros. The podcast. Yeah. Um, well, you know, in in um, ancient times, royal families, in order to keep the bloodline pure, would often have first cousins and even siblings would marry and produce offspring and you'd get these genetic deformalities and issues that would you know like look like prince harry <laughs> there's like <laughs> no there's like some like some like uh royal families of the past that would have like a specific like underbite or oh yeah it's, and they would they would name it after the family because it would get passed on and obviously amplified because yeah. of this and then you get mad, you know, what they call mad kings and queens. Well, I wonder why they're crazy. It's because their parents were- yeah, <laughs> We're not supposed to do that. Man. No, That's dude. just, it's, yeah, it's it's genetic. Like, you're, you're just messing with nature. Oh, it's gross. Anyway, uh, okay. So, my brother sold me on, I'm not a big, like, buy expensive tech guy. You guys know this. I could be- <laughs> I could be funny about that. <laughs> not a big buy anything expensive guy. Yeah, well, it yeah. depends. I'll, I'll spend money on vacations, dinner, stuff like that. But you're uh, right, yeah, I'm not. But yeah. my brother is like, dude, you got to try the AirPod Max. Oh, did you get headphones? them? Bro, they're, they're, they're on my list. They're so great. So great. Really? So Yeah, so the material that they put in the headphone definitely reduces the sweat and stuff that gets produced in your ear. It's the most comfortable headphones I've ever worn. The sound is incredible so this is for working out primarily yeah we're okay. for working out they're the best headphones i've ever i've ever owned they're mm. they've knocked it out of the park park apple does so, and then the feel of them you know what apple does really well is like the feel of their products like yeah. the, the the way that the the metal or the plastic feels or how it feels on your head or whatever they crushed it dude you're gonna get some right of course i will now for sure I'm, i've been wanting a new pair of headphones anyways and i was waiting for them to come out with they're so great i mean and they they crushed it did we bring up we did bring up the airpods thing right i thought that was oh so yeah fun. they yeah. sold it was like one of the highest tech selling yeah devices yeah period margin End of story. stuff yeah. oh yeah it's crazy it's okay. insane anyway speaking of cool stuff justin you were talking about how prx has a dumbbell rack on yeah. the wall yeah because i've been I'm How always does that paying work? attention. Well, I'm always paying attention to new accessories and things, especially when you can have wall mounted uh, options because we have right now just our dumbbells on the floor. And it's like, I, I much prefer to have them like on a rack. I was thinking about getting a rack, but then again, it's, it's now, you know, taking up space. And so they have, they have, it's kind of slanted almost like a shelf on the wall that you can mount. Uh, and it'll carry up to like uh, three sets of dumbbells. Oh, so, wow. you know, just for like your, your quick handy. And I'm sure you could buy a couple of them uh, to then wall mount. So it doesn't take up so much space. Yeah. They knocked it out of the park with their, with their, st- I mean, they're, they're just their rack, right? Their signature fold out rack is more, this is true. It's more stable than your power racks at the gym. It's yeah. extremely stable. Um, Cause that was always my worry. Like, oh, I'm going to fold. It's going to fold out against the wall. Is it going to be? Yeah, well, secure. most of the force is downward, so it's it's less of pulling back. Yeah. Um. So yeah. You, oh wow! It's like it, the, so. There's they have a kettlebell rack. Yeah, that's too. a kettlebell. I've yeah, seen that one. Kettlebell. That's so, okay. So the, dumbbell the, right the dumbbells are are like up. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. it's up and kind of slanted at like. Oh, 45. interesting. Oh, yeah. and that's easy to grab too. Exactly. Yeah. Look at that setup. Yeah, oh, they're doing I'm a great job. To do that, I'm oh, gonna get gonna, a mirror gonna do, and then put those. You know that that um, twenty. There's still a nineteen percent, nineteen percent less. People, or should I say, pre-pandemic level uh, numbers of people going to the gyms is still 
it's still lower than mm -hmm. it was uh, pre-pandemic right now. 19% of people who used to go to gyms now are working at home permanently. Oh, speaking of that, I just saw a thing mm -hmm. on, um, you know, we, the other day we were talking about the just the stocks just taking a, a, a dive. Every right? day they take And we right. talked specifically about some of the, what they called the COVID stocks, like yep. your, your uh, Netflix, Peloton. your Peloton, your Zooms, everything like that. Everybody did, they crushed your- Did you know that if you were an early investor in uh, like late, late stage early investor of like before they went public- um, uh, for Peloton, it is now valued lower than what it was Jeez. pre pre public. Lower, yeah. Wow. So imagine, okay, just imagine, because there's obviously people that did this, right? There's people that, that were uh, angel investors or VCs that put money into Peloton pre going public. They go public, they make a run all the way to 170. Imagine how many X their money was at that point. And then to, for it to come all the way back down to wow. the valuation that you potentially bought in or lower. Wow. Like, oh, yeah, wow. that's that stings. Yeah, yeah. I get all, you know, butthurt about my portfolio being cut in half right now, but that would be way worse. Yeah, those dude. pandemic stocks took a cr I mean, I own some of them. <laughs> so I'm a buy and hold guy, which didn't work really well for me <laughs> this time around. So. They're saying still, we still haven't seen the floor yet, right? They're saying that we're going to still see another, another dip over the next couple of months in the stock market. And then eventually start to bleed over into real estate, which we haven't really seen. No, yet. I think real estate inventory is going up right now with real estate. Yeah, that's what's going to cause the, That's what's going to cause it. Yeah, and what I was reading was that uh, real estate sometimes lags because there's people sellers who are just stubborn. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm not lowering the price. I'm keeping it this. And then eventually it's like, oh crap, we got to lower the price. So let's see what happens. I'll I'll welcome that because that that is a buying opportunity. For me, potentially. I mean, I, I, depending on how much it goes, right? So I, I don't know what. Uh, I mean, I've, I've heard between ten and thirty percent is what we're going to potentially see from it. I do think it's this is going to be a, a kind of a long drawn out one. Like I don't think this is going to be an overnight like all of a sudden drop. I think the stocks are the first that we see because that's more speculative. Um, the real. I mean, we're at we're at prime buy time right now in the year for housing, anyways. Mm. So the fact that it's even slowing up right now is a little scary. It's not. It's not supposed to be till October will you start to see people oh, already. See. So that, that I anticipate then October is when we're going to see the real damage. I again predicted Idaho is the the area to watch because their inventory was the highest. Uh, the the earliest, so I think they'll be a good indicator on like what you'll see. And when I go on Zillow and I look, because I look at properties all the time, right? So when I go on Zillow and I look You're over, seeing price drops, yet? yeah, there's price drops already starting to happen. Yeah, start so to that, yeah, I think you know, it's so. it's happening. I mean, and the interest rates are are. I mean, they they they're at like for a, a 30 year AAA credit, 20 25 percent down, five point something. Most people are getting like six and above now. Mm. So they're that's that's moving up really fast. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of more crazy stuff, uh there I just read some interesting information. There's some studies on NSAIDs, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, for example, yeah. or naproxen, which is, you know, brand name Aleve, showing that they may act may actually increase chronic pain over time. So using them regularly, which Often it's recommended. Oh, you got back pain? Take two of these every day. Yeah, till yeah. forever, whatever. They're starting to find that over time may actually make chronic pain worse. Now, I have a couple theories on this. Yeah, um, hey, I, theory one would be the body adapting to the insect. That's one thing yeah. that I would think, right? Your, right. Your, your body starts to produce more in response, more inflammatory markers. Right. I know people who use NSAIDs all the time, and I do know that over time they have to take more and more to elicit the same effect. The second theory I have is that whatever movement pattern or issue that you have that's causing or contributing to the chronic You're just pain, masking it because yeah. it's masked, you continue to move that's in a, a way point. that I think that's a good yeah, make things worse. Angle. And then because you have a lowered or blunted inflammatory response, you don't heal like you did before, which is why we have past studies showing that uh, athletes that chronically use uh, like ibuprofen, for example are more likely to have like a tendon rupture or tear yeah. or joint uh, degeneration. Well, I've issues. always been worried about that just because of like liver and kidneys and whatnot. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just like chronic use of those. Cause it's not, it's not good, no. uh, you know, over time, but yeah, that's interesting that, uh, uh, cause I have seen that too. You had to increase the dose and then you increase the dose. You put more stress on, you know, your liver and kidneys. So it's like this 
vicious cycle. Yeah, that. I can't think of another thing that w- I would add to that. I think that's a pretty good guess right there on both those. Body yep. getting adapted to it and then two, masking the ru- the real root cause. Yeah, that makes sense. Because normally, that, I mean, that's probably one of the most common things that you see with anybody taking any sort of pain medication is, you know, addressing it through taking yeah. a pill versus trying to get to the bottom of why am I in this chronic pain and then putting the work in yeah. because the work. How is often work- do you guys take NSAIDs, you <clears throat> say? Uh, I used to take them a lot when I had high blood pressure and I was having headaches all the time. And like, it, it really was not a good place for me. Like I felt (laughs) it was just one of those things. You don't feel good with your body. Like, you know, something is off. And so I've really tried not to take it as much as possible, like uh, going forward, but occasionally I'll have some inflammation or a headache or something. I'll take it. But, uh, usually no more than like, you know, a small dose. Yeah. I'm probably like once a month. I'll take a, I'll take ibuprofen mm-hmm. maybe once a month. And it's, it's, if I have like a late night and maybe alcohol is involved or something like that, just kind of as a way to prevent, you know, shitty sleep or whatever, but that's about it. But I know people who take them several times a day. We, oh, yeah. we rarely ever take them. The, this last year since COVID, I've taken more Advil than I've probably taken in my entire life. I would say a bottle of Advil would last my house over a year. So we don't, and that's me sharing mm-hmm. it with Katrina or anybody over that says, "Hey, do you have any Advil?" Happen. Mm-hmm. So we don't really use, we don't really use it that much. But I have used it. I mean, we I had so many headaches this last. The the worst part of COVID for me was the headaches. This recent flu that I just had was the headaches, and the coming off the caffeine was the headaches. And so I use more Advil than I think I had used probably in the previous five years all yeah. combined. So. Jessica gets migraines that are just brutal and so then she'll use ibu- but not now because she's pregnant yeah but you need intervention with those, those are hey they're fun. valuable i think it becomes a problem though when when they and i like i said i know a lot of people like this that their doctor just said oh um just take you know four of these every day forever like for the rest of your life like that can't be even just the process by which they work you're blocking a very important signaling system mm-hmm. so there's going to be downstream effects that are you know unintended consequences so Hey, real quick, uh, I want to tell you about a company we work with called Bio Optimizers. Um, one of the products is Massozymes. These are digestive enzymes designed for fitness enthusiasts like you. So maybe you eat a lot of protein, but you find when you do so, you might get a little backed up or get some digestive issues. Take Massozymes with your meal. It helps break down those proteins into amino acids so they get utilized more effectively. Your muscles get to use them more effectively, and it helps your digestion. Masszymes also contains enzymes for carbohydrates and fats. Take them with your meals for enhanced absorption and better digestion, okay? So if you're interested, go to mindpumppartners.com, click on buy optimizers, uh, and use the code mindpump10 for 10% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first question is from Josh Jackson. When training isometrics, should you do them from the stretched position where you're weaker or mid position where you are stronger? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, both equals both. Yes. yes. Do both. them all, all isometrics, do them in all positions. Um, so you could do an isometric and a stretch. But so if I'm doing a fly, right, I'd be holding a weight in this position here as an isometric, or I could push on an immovable object in this position. I could also do it mid range. I could also do it yeah. peak contraction. That being said, though, wouldn't you guys all agree that the the biggest bang for your buck, if you had to choose one or the other, is going to be in the weaker position, doing yeah. an isometric contraction. Well, yeah, if you want that strength range carryover. position, yeah, just because you don't um, typically try to generate force in some of those angles, and I think that there's massive benefits to that carrying into conventional lifts. Yeah, I'll say this <clears throat> for um, lagging body parts. Usually, typically, a lagging body part is a body part that you just don't connect to as well as other body parts. Hard for you to feel a lagging body part when you're doing a compound lift, for example. In that case, I like isometrics in the shortened position. Like if I have a tough time activating my glutes, doing a shortened position, like a hip thrust, but at the top and squeeze the glutes will help me connect more to my glutes. And I I find that to be true for any muscle group where I have a a kind of a, it's a lagging body part or poor connection. But nonetheless- um, Well, wouldn't you agree that that, that, that's for hip, or I mean for your hips, like that would, or your glutes- that would be where a lot of people are weak. 
Yeah, I people, mean, if if you have a t if you have people, a tough people aren't normally weak in the extension right on that right. It's just it's harder to connect to a muscle in its stretch position, it's and like, if you already yeah. have a tough time connecting, it's kind of like calves. I feel calves the same way too. Calves less in the stretch position, calves in the flex position. There's not really a, a really good connection. Yeah, like imagine if you, if you had those. a tough connection to your pecs, it'd be harder to, to connect to them in isometric and stretch than the peak contraction, the squeeze. So that's why I would say start there. But really, when you do an isometric, you're getting most of the strength that you get in isometric is in that position. And I think it's 20 degrees. Yeah, it's like 15 degrees. Is it 15? Both sides, yeah. 15 degrees up and down. Mm -hmm. So that's where the carryover is. So really, if you want full range of motion strength from isometrics, you do you do isometrics in different positions. And that's where you're going to get the, 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 the best results. But the other way to use them is what you guys are kind of talking about, where if I, for example, do a squat and I find that the bottom position of squat is where I'm weakest, I'll do isometrics in the bottom position and I'll gain strength in that bottom position. So then when I do my squat, it's no longer as weak as it used to be and have better control, better stability, uh, and better power. But that's the beauty of isometrics is that you can literally train strength in whatever range of motion or position you want. And so what you should do is go through your body and identify where you need the most help and then uh, you know attack that angle. And the carryover is just tremendous. Yeah, when you do where that. is there, you know, a leak of force? Like, where is there a leak of performance in your lift? Like, that's where I would hone in on and really use this technique because it's very valuable. Yeah, where do you guys prefer to do isometrics? And in and in, just just where it depends depends on where you're. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, if, like you said, in range. Like for if, for a squat, for me, it's generating force at the very bottom and really focusing in on that is where I need it the most. I did I did this morning. I did isometrics this morning, and I actually did it at both ends. And I, ironically, it was I was in you know, what triggered me to do it was uh, I was in our on our buddy uh, Eugene Tao's feed, which I know we've beaten up recently, um, and he actually had a really good post for uh, calves, and he d did an isometric hold in the stretch position and an isometric hold at the top. Oh yeah, and ten reps. So ten reps uh, with the isometric three second hold at the top, and then ten reps with an isometric hold at the bottom, and then ten full reps. Oh, massive pump and oh, felt wow. amazing on my calves okay. this morning. So, and I, I actually have not ever done that exact protocol. And of course I understand the purpose behind it. And so I thought, you know what, like that's a, now I do, I do isometric holds on my calves a lot. In fact, I'll even do stuff like this because that's a, obviously a lagging body part for me. I'll even do them like in the shower. So I'll in the shower and I'll stand up on my tippy toes and just contract and hold for 10, 15 seconds, then come down, contract. Just, I just picture you right now just in the shower and just, you do picture, you do picture me in the shower all the time. I'm gonna say I'm gonna go ahead and not. Yeah, that. yeah. You I go just, ahead. Hold on. That. You know, hey, you so know. Start, this is hold on a second. I, I picture you in the shower, Adam. Hold doing, on. Uh, hold on a second. You know for a fact. I guarantee you, you have two or three fluffy loofah things that you. I do not. I am not a. Loofah yes, guy. you do. I'm not a loofah guy. You don't got a pink. My one wife you, is. My wife has a loofah. Oh, that's what those are. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a loafer guy, dude. I'm a bar soap. Yeah, I'm a bar bar soap, and I use our our partners so uh, yeah public goods shout out to public goods it's not even a commercial there you go next question is from iron crypt customs steve what are the best rear delt workouts i've always had legging rear rear delts and i really want a full looking shoulder this must be a new person of the podcast yeah you yeah. know i know i've, done, this a, I've a, done a lot of stuff on this you have uh, passionate uh, about this you know the, the the biggest challenge with using the uh, train the rear delts is that uh, it's really hard to not totally incorporate the muscles of the back. Right. Like, when, like the staple exercise. It's very the, small range of motion. Is, is a rear fly, but very easily do people turn this into like a modified kind of row. Yeah. And then wonder why they don't develop. The you know, it's row. funny that, okay, the question that was right before this, great. this is great. So one of the single best exercises, I've got a bunch. And by the way, if you haven't gone to our Mind Pump TV YouTube and put Mind Pump TV and uh, rear delts, I think I've done, I've personally done at least three videos myself on rear delts. Yep. And I think you guys have too. So mm -hmm. lots of, uh, of content on there. One of my favorite movements uh, for training my rear delts was actually a bent over rear delt cable fly. And I use it with an isometric hold at the end. Mm. So I do a really light weight because and you're pulling through, right? Yes. It's under. So one, like to your point, um, because it's such a small muscle, and it's on your backside, it's really easy for people's back to take over the movement, like you're saying. So I love to do this bent over fly where I'm I'm pulling through and I'm I'm flying back. So and the out. cable is, is a, yeah, is it's like attached to you. It's like attached over where you're at, and I'm pulling back back and out this way. And I'll do a weight 
that is really light that I can go really slow and controlled. And then I can get an isometric hold at the end and flex my rear delt. Yep. So I can really feel it from there. And then I resist it on the way back in. And then I come back out now, again. By the way, notice, bring your arm up like you finished the, the rep. Yeah. No, notice how uh, Adam's elbow is high. Yeah. That's rear delt. A lot of people will, will externally rotate and their elbow will be closer to the body. Then you know that they're using too well, much and, back. Well, and the other cue I like is fly out, not back. Yes. Right? So we have a tendency on rear rear delt exercises. Your to chest comes up. Yeah. Then, like, guys guys will do that. You like see a bunch it, of rhomboids. You see it all the time. And you'll see them do it, doing it. And by the way, it doesn't make that movement bad or wrong. It's just, you're not going to get a lot of rear delt. Yeah. You get more you're traps. Rhomboids. Effectively. Yeah. You're going to get a lot, of, a lot of your back muscles versus hitting your rear delts. And so if you want rear delts, you know, the, the fly out cue is one of my favorite cues. Use a weight light that you can first learn to isometrically contract yeah. that muscle. Then once you've trained that, then I, then some of my favorite movements were just heavy bent over dumbbell flies, but I couldn't do that really well until I learned, like I can, I can take my arm across my body and I can flex my rear delt in this position. Yeah. So you have to learn to be able to train that, to be able to contract that small muscle, even in a position like this. Once you learn to do that, then taking cables, I mean, dumbbells, whatever you want, you can get a great workout. But the mistake that we see people make is they let their back muscles take over the movement. Yeah, another another thing I used to do with some clients just to help because what would happen is they do their rear fly and it would kind of their elbows would kind of come in and it would turn into this row. Is I would tell them to take their palms and face them back, so they're pushing out with the pinkies. That just encouraged because the, the the shoulder has nothing to do with this rotation here, but all it would do is encourage the elbow to stay out and encourage them to go out rather than back. So those are just that's just one other cue you can use to kind of. But the key is to go light. Yeah. You go light on this because trust me, it's a small, small muscle. muscle yeah. Go light on it and isolate it. If you go heavy, you're going to turn it into a back. You can't exercise. go. I mean, eventually you can get to a place where you yes, go but heavy. This guy right here, right? Yeah, no, totally. Like that. Like remember, I mean, I did all the, and that's why I think that cable exercise because we we typically tell people barbell dumbbell exercises are superior when it comes to building muscle. But here's an example of when training the movement and getting the cues down becomes the big one of the biggest challenges and when you're doing a, a free weight exercise it's really hard to to, <clears throat> to do that so here's where i love to train somebody on how to fire the rear delt then when you get really good on command being able to fire the rear delt then you can do some really cool exercises with dumbbells and barbells to really get the, the rear delts going next question is from pete on the gram you guys talk about gaining strength to gain muscle but how do you know if you're too weak in your 40s, for someone that has never lifted for strength, what should your goal be? Deadlift, squat, bench press, your weight? Should you press half your weight? Remember, yeah. Sal, the, uh, remember the thing from... Yeah, it was a chart. Yeah, the, what's the guys? What's their names? T-Nation. Yeah. T-Nation has a really cool... Now, they're using the chart to compare you to like decently strong people in gyms and stuff like that. This is a tough question to ask because how do you know if you're too weak? I mean... Oh averages and generalizations yeah it's like okay how do you know if you're too weak well do you have a poor quality of life do you notice lots of pain are you unable to perform uh, activities that you want to perform to enjoy your life if the answer to that is like no i can't do stuff i can't play with my kids i can't you know do certain things my back hurts my whatever yeah, and then you're too weak if you're strong enough to enjoy your life and you have a good quality of life then you're strong enough and you're totally fine now, the second part of the question is like, what should you be able to lift? I mean, I don't know. I, I you know, when clients would ask me, this was a tough thing to. to well, you know answer. what? You're, you're you're actually saying something because I was heading in the direction of giving them something more tangible or more specific, right? Like the um, the T Nation chart. But you're right. Like the truth is, why why do we do all this shit? Yeah. Why? I mean, why? I, do, I know some athletes that think, I mean they're not strong in the gym at all, but they can move. They feel good. They've yeah, got great and who cares? And like, here's the deal. And then okay? I know people who are hella strong. The fact that I can <laughs> squat 400 pounds on my back has not transferred over that much into real life. Not 400 pounds. The fact that I can squat over 150 pounds has. Yeah. There's plenty of times where I'm carrying a kid or I got to lift something up that yeah. weighs 100, 200 pounds. There's yeah. not a lot of times. No, there's that one I time. There's that one time you gave Justin and Doug a piggyback ride. <laughs> yeah, and that's what yeah, it really is. Yeah. There's not a lot of times where I need to be able to, you know, deadlift 550 pounds off the floor. Like just, but yeah, okay. That makes the couch really light for me. So you're right. If you, 
if you can do the things that you like to do in life and and it doesn't you know break you down or you're not sore or you're not unable to do it because you're too weak, totally. then you're technically strong enough. Totally, 100%. Okay, so here's some gym numbers that uh, you know I've communicated to people in the past and it's like, okay, well, you're doing pretty good in gym standard for a man, average guy, if you could at least bench press your weight, mm -hmm. if you could at least squat one and a half times your weight. And if you get at least deadlift twice your weight, you're doing pretty damn well. Most, a lot of people can't do those three things. Now you go beyond that. Now you're starting to get pretty damn strong. If you could bench press one and a half times your weight or two times your weight, you're pretty freaking strong. You're like in the 5%, right? If you could deadlift three times your weight, you're in the top, you know, few percent, right? Type of deal. But the numbers I gave earlier, those are I guess, cool numbers to aim for, mm -hmm. but don't get hung up. I mean, like I said, I, there were guys I used to train with in jujitsu that I, you know, I, they'd come to the gym every once in a while with me and they could, they could, I could, I could outlift them all day it was long. It's like an entirely different skill. Yeah. yeah but, they but they were badasses. strong in their sport. Yeah. yeah. We'd hit the mats and I was like, I was in danger, you know, and, and, you know, they've lived great lives and they were perfectly fine. I've worked blue collar jobs with my dad yeah, with guys that same. I could outlift all day long in the gym, but they could outwork me. Mm -hmm. you know, all day long. So it's really just about your quality of life. If you're, if you, if you can't, if you don't have a good quality of life and you can't do the things you want because you lack the strength, that's when you know that you're, you're too weak. Yeah. I actually would prefer more of like a, just testing your grip strength, uh, just because of longevity purposes and also being able to yeah. access that kind of force generation. So, because it applies to almost everything, but in terms of like very specific <laughs> compound lifts, like, you know, unless you're working on it incessantly, you know, like that's something I wouldn't really focus too hard on. You know, part of my inability to sit in a deep ass to grass squat or sit down and play with my son was also weakness in my hips. So you could technically make the case that even though I was deadlifting and squatting four or 500 pounds, I was super weak in my hips. Right. Because I, and so good mo point. mobility became this huge thing for me before Max came. Was yep, like, good point. I want to be a dad who could sit down and, do his puzzle with him in a seated position in a squatted position without getting exhausted. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I actually had to get, uh, weaker in my, in my squat and deadlift and put a lot of energy and effort into my mobility and strength in my range of motion in my hips to allow me to do those things. So technically I am a weaker from a standpoint of deadlifting and squatting today, but I have better stable and strong hips right now today than I did five years ago. Yeah. So there, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can look at this. And if you're a 40-year-old dad, potentially like we are, um, to me, that's the shit that really matters is the fact that I can comfortably get down and play with my son. Nobody's asking me, hey, Adam, are you still squatting 400 yeah, or deadlifting yeah. 500 pounds? Like, no one gives a shit about that. Like, the fact that I can get down and do those things, that is what really matters. Yeah, as long as I'm stronger than my kids' friends' dads. <laughs> it's a Justin, yeah, it's okay. Justin's line. If I'm stronger oh, yeah. than their dads, then I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's stronger than my kids. I'm going to punk them forever. <laughs> Next question is from C Smith 731. What is your opinion on the carnivore diet if someone is doing it for lifestyle purposes and not weight loss and they already eat low carb due to gut issues? God, the carnivore diet, okay, so I want to be very clear. It is not by any stretch of the imagination an ideal diet for the vast majority of people uh, on earth. It's just plain and simple, it just does not. That being said, for some people it is an ideal diet and here's probably why. It's the ultimate elimination diet for a lot of people. And some people are so, their bodies are so reactive. They have autoimmune issues that are so reactive to foods that cutting out almost everything except for the one food that is one of the most nutrient dense, complete, and the least likely in many cases to cause uh, an immune reaction. For those people, that's a great option. Uh, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter was an example of this. She really was one of the first people to come out and talk about how great it was. Her body was so reactive to everything where she would eat things and she would get mental issues and inflammatory issues that she cut everything out, but, but meat. And she had tremendous improvements in her health. I know a couple of people like this where mm -hmm. this is the case in those cases, Carnivore diet's great because the alternative is so much worse. Right. But for most people, it's not ideal. It just isn't. Fiber is an important part of our diets. There are other types of nutrients found in other foods that you're not going to necessarily find 
in meat that probably are beneficial. Plus, your quality of life isn't going to be that great if all you that's can eat a, is one food. To me, that's the real one here because the, the question says, you know, for lifestyle purposes, for lifestyle purposes, that fucking sucks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To eat just- Pretty limiting. Super, pretty limiting. It's as limited as it gets. It's the most limited diet. It doesn't I get any of. more limited than that. That's crazy. That's more limited than just the vegans meat, are. Yeah. It's just not a, it's not a, it's not a long-term strategy. Now, to Sal's point- uh, do I think it's a, a decent strategy to get to the bottom of your gut issues? Like, yeah, you eliminate down to one food and you're going to see all all those potential things go away. And then you can, but to me, that would be, the, would not be the end goal. The end goal would then mm -hmm. to be, okay, now let's start reintroducing some of these foods yeah. that I would like to be able to have for the rest of my life and see how my body responds. And so to me, it's like, why not have a diet like that? Like why, why eliminate everything just down to me just because yeah, that makes you feel good. Why not find out, you know, does potatoes make you feel that way? Does sweet potatoes make you feel that way? Does yams make you feel that way? Does quinoa make you feel that way? Does rice make you feel that way? Like, are there certain vegetables that you can eat that that make you feel that way? You know, and, and if all those other foods don't disrupt your gut and make you feel okay, why not have a carnivore-esque type of diet where you eat mostly meat, but then you introduce some of these other foods that agree with your body, and now you have more variety. Like, to me, it, this is why I can't yeah, stand- there's more work involved. That's why I can't fucking stand diets, because yeah. it becomes like a religion, where it's like all or nothing. It's like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, and it doesn't yeah. mean that all of these different diets don't have value. They wouldn't get as popular as they were if they didn't help a ton of people, right? Well, like, I get, I get it. Once it's like you finally found the thing, like, like maybe you you have been suffering from all of those autoimmune issues and all this, and nothing's worked, and now all of a sudden you've reduced it down to just meat, and it's like I can handle this. Uh, but then it's just to me, it seems like if, if there's a parallel to this, it would be like I can't, I can't do squats anymore. Right. I can't do it. I'm a doctor. It's like it's hard on my knees, you know, my back, this and that. So I'm going to avoid them, but I'm going to do these other, I'm going to do leg press only, you know? And it's just like, I'm just going to focus on that because that's the only thing that's going to benefit from me instead of then trying to work my way back, you know, and work figure my, out why, figure out why, figure out the root of it, uh, you know, start introducing other exercises that are similar and kind of work my way back. But same thing with the food. It's like, I want to, I want to make sure too, that now, okay, I can, I can actually heal my gut. I can actually like repair things. I can introduce, uh, you know, these types of food groups back, uh, in small doses and start training my yeah. body to get, uh, back to variety. And the truth is you may never find, uh, the root cause. I mean, there's some, some, there's some autoimmune issues caused by food that we still have no clue. Yeah. We have no idea. And there's some people that do carnivore, and they reintroduce anything and they get a crazy flare up and they're like, I can't do anything. And I've tested for this and I've tested for that and I've tested for everything. So then it's a great, yeah, it's great for and them it's, to stay and it, there. And it's totally fine. And, and and here's the challenge. If you, look, if you're somebody who suffered from terrible autoimmune issues, inflammation, skin issues, depression or anxiety, like mental health issues, and then you go carnivore and you all of a sudden cured all those things. You know what you're going to become? An evangelist for carnivore diet. Right. You're going to talk about it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to find all the reasons why all the other foods are probably not good. And you're going to sell that. Like plants create. Versus realizing that maybe it was asparagus, avocado, and cauliflower, which was causing this to you. And you had, and but you got rid of everything, including that. Could be, or it could be everything. Like I, I know there's some people that's like, no matter what I eat, I mean, you know, okay, fine. Uh, but, but, and they'll make the case. They'll say, look, plants have defense mechanisms. Yeah, they do. But that's why we cook them. That's why we, we, you know, we process them in particular ways. Like that's what humans have been doing that for a long time. What you don't want to do is ignore thousands of years and millions of people who have eaten certain foods and have thrived. There's cultures that have thrived on eating lots of grains and lots of vegetables. That might not be good for you. And there's a huge individual variance. Mm -hmm. But what you don't want to do is become an evangelist where you tell everybody, I, you learn this as a coach, man. You learn this hard as a coach. Because yeah. when you become a coach or a trainer, the, when you first become a trainer, you, you are an idealist. Every yeah. trainer, when they first become a trainer, 
Well, just, especially when you see something work. You're yes. just like, oh, cool. I'm going to use the same playbook on oh, this yeah. person. Do you guys remember this? You're well, just, you quick, then you quickly realize, like, oh, that, shit. You never can do the same <laughs> thing you twice. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, you're, you're an idealist. Like, no, everybody has to do this, and everybody's not going to do well with this, and gluten affects everybody poorly, and this is great for everyone, and here's the best. And then you train a whole bunch of people, and if you really care about them, you start going, oh, well, yeah, there's a couple people, or that there's was always an exception that didn't work, rule. and that person over there, like... You know, we, we, we did an interview recently with NutriSense where we had one of their dietitians come on and talk about their continued glucose monitor. And she was talking about how, like for her, for example, a sweet potato, which on the glycemic index, the glycemic index of a sweet potato is lower than a plain, than a white potato. White potato affects her, her, her insulin way better than sweet potato. Sweet potato causes it to spike. There's some people that are like that with like an avocado. It's all fat. And then you see these crazy spikes or whatever. There's a huge individual variant. So um, there's general rules, but these specifics just, they don't, and, and carnivore is just, it's, it does not, it is not an ideal diet for most people. For a few people, for a very small percentage, it is because their body is so reactive, but for most people, it just isn't. And that's just. Well, and that was my fact. point of saying that if, addressing the whole lifestyle part of this, like if this is going to be a lifestyle thing for the rest of your life, then why I wouldn't stop at just the carnivore diet. I would maybe utilize that diet to yeah. eliminate a lot of foods, but my desired outcome would be to get to the bottom of things like that. And I tell you what, someone who who is listening to this that it, this it, you know rings true for you, or you're like this, you're a great example of somebody who should look into like NutriSense and a glucose monitor and see how those different carbohydrates are affecting you. Because see what's you, going on. You may have that exact exact thing. You'll. I mean, I told you I had that similar experience when I was messing with different foods. Dude, I had I had literally like a half of a cinnamon roll. That shit went through the roof. Yet I could eat ten tacos and my body was like totally fine. It didn't mm -hmm. look. It looked like I had a nice balanced low calorie meal. So you don't know until you start testing some of these things. And I think there's tremendous yeah. value and I would never want to eliminate everything down to one, one food group for the rest of my life and consider if that. If you can a help it, lifestyle. right? Yeah, no. Yeah. It's funny when I first, when Doug first read the question, I, th I thought it meant for moral reasons. I'm like, who eats just meat for more? <laughs> I want to save all the plants. I can. <laughs> and I hate cows. I only want to murder. So morally. I just want to, yeah, yeah, I just want to eat meat. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. And again, they're all totally free. There's a lot of them on there. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. 